There we we are live. Let me just make sure that Facebook has synced in. Hi, everyone. If anyone's watching right now, I'm going to give this a couple of seconds. Okay. Hello, everyone. We've already got 79 people in the room. So I think that's plenty for us to go ahead and start. Oh, 80 people. Everyone wants to know all about you, Dave. Um, so hello, everyone. I'm Kara Zelaya from Daily Coast. Uh, and today we are going to be having a conversation with David Nywert, who is a journalist, author, uh, specializing in the American right wing extremism. He has appeared on, oh God, anywhere you could imagine, Anderson Cooper, CNN, The Rachel Maddow Show. Uh, he's appeared on The American Prospect, Washington Post, MSNBC, Salon.com, and is, of course, a staff writer here at Daily Coast. Uh, he received the National Press Club Award for Distinguished Online Journalism for a domestic terrorism series that he produced for MSNBC. And of, co of course, on top of all of that, David's an acclaimed author with um, Alt America, The Rise of the Radical Right in the Age of Trump, and with a new book titled Red Pill, Blue Pill, How to Counteract the Conspiracy Theories That Are Killing Us, which is out now. So, Dave, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, the pleasure. Good to see you, Kara. Yeah. Um, so uh, I asked on a Facebook for our readership uh, if they had any questions for you or I actually labeled it as do you have any questions for someone who specializes in American right wing extremism? And I think a few people thought that I meant like we were going to talk to someone who's in the like, far right. So um, there was a, a whole grab bag to ask from. But I guess I want to start with um, how what are the roots of the right-wing extremist movement here in the United States? Well, right-wing extremism has been around for really almost since the forms of it have existed since, you know, early in the nation's history. You know, you can go back to the know-nothings and the nativists of the 1840s. Uh, and some of you people even go back to the Whiskey Rebellion of the late 1790s. Um, but more uh, more recently, you know, here in the 20th, 20th century uh, is when we really saw what we think of as the modern radical right uh, forming really in the early uh, 20th century around uh, ideas like eugenics and um, conspiracist ideas like the Protocols of the Seven Elders of Zion, which were actually first promoted in America by by Henry wow. Ford, by Henry Ford, no less. Uh, <laughs> oh, cool. <laughs> yeah, um, and the, yeah, Hitler picked up Ford's published Putner version, uh, English version of the protocols, and used them uh, in his propaganda. So, um, yeah, and he later awarded uh, Henry Ford the Iron Cross. So, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, there, there's a lot of roots of the far right that we think of as European uh, that actually began in America. Um, and, you know, we had the Ku Klux Klan in the 1920s and 30s. And much of that went away after World War II, uh, partly because I think the whole world was horrified by the uh, results uh, of uh, the program of right-wing extremists that we saw in the form of the Holocaust. Yeah. And for the most part, uh, you know, right-wing extremists had had a pretty lively presence in the American political landscape through the 20s and 30s, and that largely vanished uh, in the 40s, and they became really fringe 
in uh, much of the 50s and 60s, although uh, organizations like the Ku Klux Klan were still very active at that time. Um, and, but, you know, we saw neo-Nazis uh, in the form of like the American Nazi Party, which formed in the late 50s. And it was really just always pretty much a fringe operation. And that was where most of the neo-Nazi really fringe or the really radical right uh, existed for, you know, most of the 20th century after World War II. Uh, it was only in the 1990s uh, that we started seeing uh, right wing extremism sort of gaining uh, traction, particularly in rural areas in the form of uh, the Patriot Militia Movement, which is basically a watered down version of uh, white supremacist ideology present wrapped sort of wrapped in, a, in an American flag and presented as constitutionalism or what have right. you. And that was for the, the uh, you know, the militias and people like that first really began organizing. And, and uh, it's, it was also when we started seeing conspiracism really start to take root as a discrete, uh, sorry, political phenomenon. Um, that really took off after 9-11. Yeah. Uh, and much of the radical right, the, the patriot movement became quiescent during the Bush years. Uh, but then it came roaring back to life, uh, even well before even, I mean, really during the Obama years. Uh, yeah. It was actually originally a response to his candidacy that we started seeing uh, these uh, groups forming, you know, in 2007 and eight. Yeah. And, uh, and then after he won election, of course, it, we saw suddenly this significant spike in uh, the organizing of Patriot militia groups. Um, and we saw it really kind of, it reached numbers that far surpassed anything we saw in the 1990s. By 2011, I think we had nearly a thousand such groups. Wow. Uh, yeah, and I think the highest numbers we had in the 90s were 600 and some. So, um, and uh, what was really more disturbing as much as anything was that we saw this right-wing extremism being mainstreamed, being trundled into the mainstream through the venue of the Tea Party, uh, which right. just became a conduit for patriot militia movement ideas. And this is also the same time that conspiracism in the form of, you know, Alex Jones style conspiracy theories really took off as a sort of, uh, it was no longer a cottage industry. It was sort of a significant media presence. Right. And, uh, you know, the, the sort of coalescence of those two trends um, really led us to where we are today. And, and a lot of that history, of course, is what I describe in Alt America, mm -hmm. which was an attempt to uh, put sort of, put a historical context on, on where we are now so that people understand how we got here. Right, yeah. Uh, and, and the more recent book, Red Pill, Blue Pill, is really kind of an attempt to um, give people uh, tools mm -hmm. that they can use for uh, dealing with conspiracism in their own lives and potentially even pulling friends and loved ones out of the rabbit holes of conspiracism Right. Uh, that we now just see overwhelming the, so much of our discourse these days. Absolutely. Um, I can't help but uh, notice this, like you, you talked about how in the 90s, we kind of started to see a rise of that. And uh, we have a question that came from one of our Facebook uh, community members, which was how much has Facebook contributed to this sort of mainstreaming of white nationalist <laughs> beliefs. And then also, like you said, the 90s, and I can't help but think, well, like, well, that was when the internet really started to, to take off in the United States. There has to be some correlation, right? Yeah, that's like asking how much clouds contribute to rain. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, Facebook has, Facebook, social media in general, uh, uh, and the internet have been uh, major conduits. Um, and of course, Facebook isn't alone. I, I think YouTube has really a significant role in the growth of this extremism. 
uh, partly because of its algorithms and partly because it just tolerated this garbage on their right. platform for so long. And, you know, Twitter, to a lesser extent, Twitter has taken its role a bit more seriously and seems to be trying, at least, to mm -hmm. crack down on this stuff. But Facebook has been, has turned really, I, I, I only go on it now for my family and friends and my foil friends to chat with them. Right. The, uh, I don't do any political stuff there anymore because it's just a garbage platform. Yeah. And it's becoming, it's just, and I don't want to contribute to it, frankly, because it is... Uh, one of the major contributors of the spread of extremism uh, and uh, conspiracism uh, in in American life and in our discourse, and be partly because it tolerates so much of it. Right. And um, you know, they they make these uh, attempts to crack down on Boogaloo uh, Facebook pages. Boogaloo is the right wing. Um, idea of uh, having a, a civil war. Oh, look, there's my kid oh, friend. We have a friend. <laughs> yeah, there's my friend. Uh, I'll bring mine. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, and and of course the QAnon conspiracy theories right. have, have really taken root, and they, and they make these sort of half-hearted attempts. Oh, we we removed uh, 35 pages, you know. <laughs> you know well, well, that's great. We have thousands of them with millions of of uh, participants you right. know? and that's the concerning thing as much as anything is that not only has it spread it's spread in such large numbers and and it's got to be pointed out that the COVID-19 pandemic has actually contributed significantly to this we saw the numbers particularly on QAnon pages mm -hmm. just spike like crazy beginning in mid-March Wow! because <laughs> everybody's staying at home Everybody's yeah. on their computers now, and uh, people are uh, succumbing to this stuff because they're spending so much time online, and it's so readily available online now. Right. And yeah, the, yeah, they've they've made some attempts to to pull it back, but uh, Facebook really has been a significant problem. And can you tell us a little bit about QAnon? Because I know that before I started reading your pieces, I was like, who is Q? What is what is happening? So, and, and that seems to be the, the main uh, group that we're seeing right now during the COVID pandemic, and then also during the wildfires. And like, I mean, right. it's everywhere. So could you expand well, a little bit? Yeah, and, and of course, uh, and it's not just Q that's spreading a lot of the conspiracy theories about the wildfires. That A lot of that, that, that actually is coming from uh, these patriot uh, mm. proud boy types okay. who are uh, spreading the hoax rumors of Antifa fires mm -hmm. and uh, Antifa arsons. Right. You know, and they're, they're the same people who a month and a half ago were promoting this hoax rumor of Antifa buses right. <laughs> showing up in these rural towns yeah. uh, poised to, you know, financed by George Soros. <laughs> Wonder what that means. Yeah, <laughs> no anti-Semitism yeah. here. Right, uh, right. Um, anyway, the uh, and it was you know that that these uh, black-clad uh, leftists were going to be descending on these poor, unsuspecting rural towns and wreaking havoc on their homes and looting businesses. You know, blah blah right. blah. And of course, and so what happened, you know, was that the, the streets of these towns were flooded with, you know, guys driving around with American flags and Gadsden flags and Confederate flags on their pickup trucks mm -hmm. uh, with their AR-15s hanging out, you know, and um, yeah, it was, it turned into a pretty ugly scene. So now we've seen sort of the, the, the similar response uh, to the response of the Antifa arsonists uh, right. out there in these rural areas. These guys are going out with their AR-15s and doing citizens patrols to, and you know, putting up um, signs warning looters will be shot. And uh, once I remember said, uh, your body will not be found, you know, and- so who, who started the, like Q and- Yeah. Do, well, do we know? So yeah, yeah, it was a guy on 8chan. Okay. Uh, or and actually I think the first one's around 4chan. Yeah, the okay. original- um, the original QAnon posts by the original Q were uh, posted on 4chan. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, uh, uh, 4chan, I believe, uh, uh, banned the subject. And so all of 
the QAnon fans moved to 8chan, which is the even wilder free speech uh, <laughs> message board. Uh, yeah, 4chan, of course, is uh, 4chan and 8chan are these message boards where literally anything goes. Wow. And uh, they're just cesspools of uh, really ugly behavior, you know, a lot of it juvenile in nature, but. Um, still quite vicious and violent and threatening rhetoric uh, being very commonplace as well as, you know, pornographic stuff. And right. what have you. Right. Um, and these guys, um, yeah, they, he posted these uh, original posts and they, the, it was th this genius of Q, <coughs> excuse me, was that it was formulated in such a way that it was, poised is sort of positioned in the world of the, you know, the alternative universe of conspiracy theories as a meta theory, mm -hmm. as a, is sort of all encompassing theory. And that's part of why it's been able to spread so far because it connects right. all these other various conspiracy theories up. And this is, you know, sort of a, a byproduct of I mean, it really in some way, I suppose that this is a logical outcome because it's something that we've observed uh, people who have been in the world of conspiracism for a long time know that anybody who buys one conspiracy theory rarely just buys one. Right. They usually buy into a whole universe of associated conspiracy theories. Of course. And... And QAnon is this kind of has created this universe where, in addition to you know the world of world that they create, where you know Donald Trump is secretly uh, planning to arrest, uh, is work it was secretly working with the deep state to bring about the arrests of this cabal right. of, of a, a, a pedophile a global pedophile ring, right? Uh, operated by uh, major Democrats and liberal media figures, uh, you know, Tom Hanks, Tom Hanks um, uh, and of course, George Soros and Hillary sure. Clinton and Barack Obama, as well as, um, you know, just is, is a whole litany, but yeah, Tom Hanks and uh, uh, I, I'm trying to remember who, uh, yeah, anyway, yeah, these, these poor hapless unsuspected, yeah, H Hanks when he got the coronavirus, <laughs> right. uh, you know, it was a popular conspiracy theory that that was actually he had been arrested by oh. the deep state, and that was just a cover for his arrest and execution. He had already been taken to Guantanamo and executed. <laughs> oh, Dave, your day your day must be so wild because I'm sure you just spend so much time reading the wildest conspiracy. I mean, you know, there's one thing. I, I try to go hang out with whales if I can. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Seriously, I, I well, love that for way, you. The only way I can say, keep my sanity. So, yeah, so, yeah. But, but, I mean, because that's the thing too about how how absurd these things are. Like, I I can understand being skeptical of political figures. Like, we should right. be skeptical of of everyone in of a position of power. Right, 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 right. But no, like, it's not normal skepticism. See, right, I, of course, right. I, I'm a I'm an old copy editor and news editor, and part of my job was vetting people's copy, and so right. I, I understand what proper healthy skepticism exactly. is, uh, is called fact checking. Yes, yes. <laughs> and, and there's one thing that they don't actually do. What mm -hmm. theirs is uh, the world of conspiracism, and of course, this long precedes QAnon, is this world of very of extremely selective skepticism right um where essentially they disbelieve anything that's the official story mm -hmm. uh reported by the mainstream media oh or if, if it's if it's reported by the mainstream media it's got to be fake news of course and so now you got to go digging for the real story which of course alex jones and and uh, the the health ranger will be happy to provide you sure. <laughs> and, and they they um and and that's part of and it's but it's like I say it's an extremely selective skepticism because it turns into this extreme gullibility right. for for anything that these guys toss your way mm -hmm. then oh, oh yeah well thanks Alex <laughs> yeah that's <laughs> a lot. oh that's 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 the real story you know and it's like, right you know um so so it's this bizarre netherworld world where 
where they think they're being smart, but mm -hmm. actually they're they're opening themselves to an incredible degree of manipulation. Right. Uh, they think that they're being ahead of everybody. And this is the thing, one of the main aspects of conspiracy theories is that they do feel incredibly empowering. Sure. You feel, you feel like, you know, hey, I, I have I have information nobody else has. Right, of course. Uh, or, or just a few other people. You know, and, and I'm hooked up with all those other people. And, you know, they're telling me the real story. And all you sheeple around me are going to be, you know, you're all going to get hauled off to the FEMA camps. <laughs> <laughs> and, well, I think and, I, and I'm going to be ahead of the game because I'm smarter than that, right? And, 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 and it, it's so, and it, it's also, there's a second level of empowerment that you feel right. when you initially join, which is forming these, joining these communities. You suddenly feel like, oh, you know, and they welcome you and, you know, you're suddenly, your ideas are important too and, and things you talk about matter and all this, so on and so forth. So that's that's sort of the up side of the arc of mm -hmm. conspiracism. But the problem is that once you kind of get up to that point and dwell in this alternative universe for a while, it becomes overwhelming. <coughs> Excuse me. It becomes overwhelming because um, and because it's incredibly dark yeah. world that they occupy that is full of nefarious evil plotters and Ultimately, you could have to conclude that you know you're up against forces so powerful and dark and and uh, effective that you have no chance. And so, the ultimate endpoint of it, uh, so then it becomes a, a system, a, a process of disempowerment. Right. That comes with conspiracism. That uh, first of all, all your friends and family abandon you. And you know, this is one of the things you you find in a lot of QAnon threads. Is these guys commiserating with each other about, oh yeah, none of my friends will talk to me anymore because they all think I'm nuts. But they'll see one of these days. Right. Boy, golly, you know, when they get those kids out of those tunnels, <laughs> yeah. where, where the where the cabal has been holding these kids to suck their adrenochrome, they will know then. Yeah. You know, and 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 that's what they really genuinely believe. You know, none of the stuff that Q announced ever or that Q has ever predicted, of course, has ever actually that's happened. Never. Uh, so they, they keep waiting and waiting and waiting. And, uh, and, I mean, and, this, and so and this is also part of the disempowerment arc when, you know, the sort of disappointment starts setting in. And this is when infighting also sets in within the community. Right. So So then you become disempowered not just from your friends and family and you know physical community, um, but you also get to uh, eventually, because the nature of these communities is extremely paranoid and suspicious and contentious, uh, these people always devolve into incredible infighting that's quite vicious and um, you know, yeah, you're a narc. No, you're a fed. No, you're a narc, you know, <laughs> this stuff. And, uh, yeah. Um, and what you're describing uh, and, is, is and, the making of a cult, though. No. Yeah, and, and and but also along the way, you know, you're you're also politically disempowering yourself because these people don't they stop voting because they think the votes that the whole election process is part of the deep state scam, and wow. and then. You know, I mean, and so the end point of the narrative arc of conspiracism is typically one of two ends. Um, most often, it's this state of utter isolation where you, you know, move off to the woods and buy a cabin in Montana and get a, a three-year supply of rice and beans, or uh, you, uh, an incredibly isolating uh, and disempowering uh, scenario. Or in in some cases, uh, some of the more unstable folks, and I go th into this in some detail, um, act out uh, in violent ways, mm -hmm. uh, typically with these mass killings. It's not an accident that just about every single one of the mass killings we've had in the last 10 years has been at the hands of a right-wing conspiracy theorist. Yep, yeah. Um, and... Um, and I, and, I, and I go into what, the whys and wherefores of how this came about and, and how, you know, the psychology behind it, there's a lot of authoritarianism involved. 
Yeah. Um, well, and, that's, and, that, and that's what and that's what QAnon ultimately is is this deeply authoritarian personality cult revolving around Donald Trump. And the author authoritarianism is really fascinating to me. And, and actually, uh, Jan C. Laughlin from Facebook asked, um, "How pervasive is the, the right wing extremism in police departments and military across the country? And can it be rooted out? Are we able to quantify this in some way?" Um, not until, I mean, I, I'm afraid that a lot of it has, over the last 10, 15 years, has really uh, become deeply embedded in police culture, which is why we're seeing the kind of behavior from our police departments that we're seeing in the streets the last several months, um, and which I've been observing in Portland and Seattle for the last three years. Um, you know, they're... Um, one of the things that's definitely happened to cops is that, you know, <laughs> these guys all watch Fox News. Right. Um, and they've just been, uh, that they get propagandized into believing these narratives, you know, first of all about, you know, Antifa mm -hmm. as being this nefarious existential threat to the nation and, you know, having been out there in the streets and seen what's actually going on, I can tell you it's not. But um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, nonetheless, the police believe this stuff. Right. Um, so, and the danger has been growing for a long time. We started uh, reporting when I was uh, a freelancer back in the late 2000s uh, and working for Crooks and Liars. Um, we started reporting on how, and, and a lot of this was coming from places like uh, uh, Southern Poverty Law Center, who I yeah. did work for from 2013 till 2019. Yeah. Um, uh, it, we started really seeing these trends of recruitment of law enforcement officers as well as um, uh, military veterans. Mm. Um, the, and the military veterans, you recall, was became really a, an issue when DHS in 2009 issued a bulletin warning that uh, right-wing extremists were going to be recruiting, returning veterans from the wars. And um, Fox News and Michelle Malkin and that whole contingent got a hold of it and turned it into a, a right-wing scream fest uh, and got DHS to not only withdraw that bulletin, uh, but they wound up gutting their whole section that was devoted to monitoring right-wing extremists. Right. Um, and uh, so um, there's a lot of institutional uh, hesitance to, to look at these groups, but there is, it was at the same time, uh, like I say, the, so and the veterans really pose a, a very significant threat, I should add, because mm. let's talk about that a little bit, because uh, they're competent at uh, handling weapons and materiel. Yeah. Um, and they pose a much greater risk uh, if they, of domestic terrorism if they become involved in these extremist organizations that have a record of uh, fomenting terrorist acts. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's what we call the McVeigh effect. Yeah. Uh, we'd had a number of right wing extremists do really low level uh, attacks in the 90s. Uh, that never went anywhere because they were all incompetent boobs who were mostly fantasists who were really incapable of pulling anything off. Right. But then McVeigh, who was a, a veteran of the Gulf War, right. uh, came along and that uh, was a very different story. And the same happened with Eric Rudolph, who was also an Army veteran. Yeah. Uh, the man who set off the bomb at the Olympics uh, in 96. Yeah. So that effect is very concerning and mm -hmm. was one of the reasons obviously dhs uh, issued that so so the the presence of, mili of extremism uh, and the recruitment of uh military veterans uh has always been a problem but then separate from that is uh, or not separate but sort of related to it very much is this recruitment of uh, uh people within police departments yeah and uh, they, <laughs> yes. 
<laughs> she, she's she knows this is a tough sub. It's a tough yeah, subject. <laughs> yeah, yeah she's, she's come hanging around. Um, yeah. The the well, yeah. I mean, it's obviously very concerning because these are supposed to be the people who are keeping us safe. Mm -hmm. And, and I got to tell you, as someone who uh, I was the uh, um, consultant for uh, law enforcement for a number of years, because we would give talks on how to identify sovereign citizens who have always been the, the they're the far right extremists who kind of grew out of the scene in the 90s and uh, have a long record of killing police officers, uh, mm -hmm. mostly at traffic pullover stops. Wow. And we would give seminars, uh, I would give seminars and talks on, uh, to people on how to identify that as well as how to uh, identify uh, neo-Nazi activity in their neighborhoods and that sort of thing. And I thought it was really interesting that while while I was working uh, for the Southern Poverty Law Center, which really does specialize in providing those kinds of seminars and that information to law enforcement, um, that while I was working for the SPLC, uh, they saw their uh, uh, the demand for those seminars just fall off the cliff beginning around. 2014 and 15. Wow. And and uh, and during the Trump years in particular. Um, wow. And um, and I'm not sure why, but I but I believe it has to do with this sort of shift in police culture that we've seen in the last year, ten years, where they've become increasingly um, insular for one thing, and then in that insularity, they have uh, definitely developed uh, very strong right-wing political leanings. So, and there are actual organizations uh, in the Patriot Militia movement and uh, that specifically uh, uh, recruit law enforcement officers and the Oath Keepers in particular is one of these. And there are also... Um, did, not, did the Klan not do that as well? Or was there not some, or at least some other white supremacists? So, so there, yes. <clears throat> and, you know, and that's part of the spectrum. <clears throat> the larger spectrum is the number of officers we've seen recruited into uh, the Oath Keepers, as well as 3% uh, militias. Right. Um, and as well as more recently, we've seen police officers participating uh, in the Proud Boys and wearing their shirts and their gear, right. uh, and and flashing the OK sign. Uh, and then finally, um, yeah, there are there is actually uh, infiltration of law enforcement by uh, overt white supremacists, and most of those guys, uh, they're pretty small in number typically. Um, they and they uh, really do go undercover because you know you can't be open about that during training or uh recruitment you can usually start showing it once you're sort of an established officer and that's often what happens wow uh, but yeah there are um police officers who do have um actual white supremacist background and they and the number of them are guys you know that we knew were uh skinheads and that sort of thing once upon a time and decided to you know straighten up their act and get into policing <laughs> well, yeah well, well, and, and they, well, funny thing they didn't change their ideology at all of course <laughs> of course <Why? laughs> they, they still get to beat up brown people that way you know? yeah exactly um and, and I, I guess that's something that is uh really confusing to anyone who's not in this type of conspiracy belief where it's like they continue to rail against the man and like against the government and that like all of these people are gonna come in and take away whatever rights they think they have. And it's like, well, mm -hmm. who do you, who do you think is gonna do that if it's not the police? Like I don't, and right. then they go and join, like it's all very, none of it makes sense, of course. Well, none of it does. And, and, and a good example of that is the Boogaloo movement. Right. Uh, which is incredibly confused as far as that goes. I mean, uh, really a lot of the initial Boogaloo organizing that I saw online was revolving around, you know, how they were actually planning to, their first targets were federal agents. Uh, right. They called them alphabet boys. 
And um, that was initially who they, because it was going to be the alphabet boys who came and took their guns away. Because, you know, the initial impetus for planning for a civil war was to defend their gun rights. Sure. Um, but the movement really grew and spread and a lot of the motives shifted and changed. And so and we wound up uh, having, you know, a lot of guys who are in the Boogaloo movement now who are very sympathetic to law enforcement. Uh, and show up to these pro-police rallies uh, with their AR-15s and camo gear and body armor. Right. So, um, Tina Phillips right now on our Facebook live stream just asked, well, how do we stop them? <laughs> Which I think is the question we're all asking. How do we stop, you know, everything from it seeping into our law enforcement to just misinformation we see on Facebook? Like, how do yeah. we actually do anything about this? <sighs> um, well, there's no rest for the wicked. <laughs> um, yeah. uh, it's because it's a lot of work. Uh, yeah. we're, we're in a very deep hole uh, and uh, on a, a multiple number of fronts. I mean, there's a lot of things we can do. I mean, obviously, as far as I'm concerned, the first thing to do is show up and vote in November um, because, you know, Donald Trump is the number one reason we have these uh, trends ascendant in America today. Uh, he basically took the lid off the Pandora's box and all the demons came out. And, yeah. Uh, and that's what we're dealing with now. Uh, mm -hmm. So we need to get, try to put that lid back on if we can. Uh, and but, then how do we catch all the demons if we do? <laughs> like, yeah, we yeah. back? Well, 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 things like par the paramilitary groups, the uh, three percenters mm -hmm. and militias and Proud Boys and groups like that. Uh, one of the things we could and, and should start doing, frankly, is uh, is enforcing our laws. We Actually, all 50 states have laws on the book against private armies and paramilitary organizations. We just don't enforce them. <laughs> Partly because they all claim that they can do this under their Second Amendment rights, but there's nothing in the Second Amendment that permits you to form private Militias of vig comprised of vigilantes who are absolutely accountable to no one, right. not to the public, not to anyone. Right. And and indeed, all of these militias, whenever something bad has happened, uh, and somebody tries to hold them accountable, they say, "Oh no, he wasn't a member of us. He belonged to you know whatever." You know, they they take zero responsibility for any of the violence that occurs. Uh, under their umbrellas, mm -hmm. and um, and that's you know that's not what uh, that's not what the founding fathers had in mind. Trust me, <laughs> when they when they wrote the Second Amendment and talked about this militias, they're not talking about these uh, private armies because yeah. uh, there's nothing in the Constitution that gives them the right right to form these. And we, in fact, like I say, most every single state has laws on the book that specifically outlaw these. Most of them were written in the early 1900s, late 1890s, uh, yeah. when private armies were being used by uh, the uh, the robber barons to uh, crack down on, on unions. Right, right. Um, but uh, it's fundamentally the same thing now because these right-wing extremists are really out there committing violence on behalf of corporate interests and you know the oligarchic interests that have put donald trump in power yeah so yeah absolutely yeah um there was a question sorry i want to make sure that i get the name right um can we prosecute people for misleading these groups. I think you touched a little bit on that, but I guess how do we really, with the rise of the internet and like social media and anonymity, how can we really put a penalty on just disinformation besides holding mm -hmm. the big companies? I guess it would have to be holding companies responsible or? No, I think I think the people who are on these platforms have an obligation not to permit them to become used right. for the dissemination of false information. Mm -hmm. And part of the problem is that, you know, we actually have court rulings that have uh, legalized the dissemination of, of false information. Um, I think it should be against the law, right. frankly. Yeah. Uh, and and I think 
there we can that we can find ways of writing laws that are compatible with the First Amendment uh, that you know do not permit people to deliberately disseminate disinformation. To, you yeah. know, knowingly false information, provably false information, and do we have they, examples uh, of that in other countries? What's, what's that? Sorry, do we have examples of that in other countries? Like, I know that Germany is very good about specifically like anti-Nazi sentiments, but yeah. is this information something that, you know, that you've studied I mean, internationally? Is, yeah, no, there are nobody, there's nobody that I know of that has any laws against, on the mm, board, against okay. disinformation. Uh, but I believe that actually New Zealand uh, has been toying with the concept mm -hmm. um, for obvious reasons, <laughs> you know? Um, <laughs> They've been dealing with the, you know, the the aftermath of the Christchurch uh, incident uh, for the last two years now. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, Jude on our Facebook chat asks, how likely is it that there will be uh, civil unrest post the election? Do you think? Very, very. <laughs> very. Both before and, and after. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I think we're in a no-win situation. Mm -hmm. Um where, you know, if Trump wins, then his violent um, followers are going to go try to uh, exact uh, revenge on his critics. Um, and uh, particularly, you know, if, uh, I'm sure that there will be pro anti-Trump protests if he does win, and these people will be out there with their weapons. Um, but I think the far more for likelier scenario, uh, judging from the polls right now, is that he's going to lose both the popular vote and probably the Electoral College. But I think the latter uh, may well be contested mm. and during the uh, process of that being contested, uh, of that contest, there is going to be a lot of um, reactive violence. And there will be, you know, partly because there's going to be demonstrations uh, demanding you know, if, if he has lost this thing, that he stepped down and these people are going to come out with their guns and be prepared to defend him. Um, and uh, we've seen a lot of the discussion. Um, my friend Jason Wilson, friend, I should say friends, Jason Wilson and, and Robert Evans, who worked down in Portland, uh, just published yesterday in Bellingcat and in The Guardian, uh, this report on uh, this group um, called American Wolf. They're basically a militia group based down in, uh, in here in Western Washington. The, uh, their chats of uh, where they basically were uh, planning uh, to do intimidation around the election itself, to be guarding ballot boxes, to wow. be uh, threatening people at the polls, and then also strategizing for violence uh, before and after uh, the, the election itself. And so, and it's really an eye-opening expose. I urge everyone to go read it because um, it really gives you a, a window into the mindset that we've been seeing. I, I spend a lot of time monitoring these people on Telegram and the other platforms that they use to chat amongst themselves. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I need to go get a hot shower every day afterwards. Yeah, cause, yeah. Cause it's, it's really crawling in the sewers. Um, uh, it's it's just vile stuff and really disturbing. And so, yeah, I've taken up smoking again. <laughs> oh, no, <laughs> David, we need you. <laughs> Go look at the whales. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it is stressing me out. I got to tell you. I mean, no, I've been around this for a long time, but yeah. I got to I got to tell you, I, I'm just I'm more worried right now than I ever have been in my life. And yeah. And I think we all should be worried. Uh, yeah. And I think we, you know, at the end of the day, uh, our democracy is being threatened by these people. And, um, uh, you know, we need to defend it. The democracies can fail. Ours is the oldest and most mature democracy, most robust democracy in the world. But democracies can fail, and ours is no exception. Yeah. We become kind of arrogant and... and blithe about that and uh, i don't think we can afford to be any longer yeah and, and especially in a year when you know we've seen our kind of the things that we thought wouldn't fail fail like 
you know, the Department what, of Justice. <laughs> well, yeah. The Department of Justice. I mean, I was thinking more of, of the pandemic, where I remember yeah, yeah. early on being CDC. Right, right, right. Like, yeah, it, it, we've seen these institutions just these these deeply embedded, uh, very established institutions. I mean, the DOJ has always been. I mean, it's always been this kind of sacred institution that represented much more than any kind of partisan administration. It was always about, it It was a department that really kind of embodied the rule of law mm -hmm. in America. And to see it utterly degraded and corrupted by William Barr the way it has been in the last two years is, I'm sure it's just, I'm sure it's a gut punch to right hundreds and hundreds of career prosecutors who are in that department because yeah. it's like a priesthood. I don't know if you've ever dealt, yeah. With, yeah. dealt with DOJ people, but it is like yeah. priesthood, you know, and they take great pride in their independent integrity. Yeah. Um, and it's gone. It's yeah. just gone, you know? Uh, well, I, on that note, I'm going to try. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> do, we have, do, we, do we have any more good questions here? Yeah, I have. Uh, I just wanted to, uh, we're, we're going to wrap up because we want to keep it under an hour. But oh, I okay. wanted you to tell us all about your latest book. And also, uh, my personal question is, is the red pill a reference to the Reddit, uh, subreddit red pill? Or? <laughs> well, yes, 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 absolutely. Okay. So, uh -huh. so red pilling, of course, is the metaphor uh, that, right-wing conspiracy theories seized on from the matrix mm -hmm. where you take the red pill or the blue pill and if you take the red pill you awaken and see the reality and oh you can see the deep state and the nefarious operations of that cabal of oh, they just happen to be jewish <laughs> right, <laughs> right. they call right. them globalists now right <laughs> oh, <sure. laughs> but you can't read anyway. anti-semitism then right yeah, and, and so it's, it's essentially it's a book long argument that um, that the red pill actually has the opposite effect of what people think they're getting when they take it. They mm -hmm. think that they're opening or that they're uh, suddenly uh, uh, ending the manipulation by these by these outside by these outside influences who are um, affecting the, the media narratives. And um, what they're actually doing is they're, they're submitting themselves, their thinking, and their, their entire patterns of thought. Uh, I mean, it becomes cognitive at mm -hmm. some point uh, to uh, people who have political agendas and are working, trying very hard to manipulate them. Mm -hmm. uh, they're, be, they're opening themselves up to manipulation in ways that they don't recognize and you know it's it's sort of it becomes a mirror of what they think they're getting when it's a it's an inverse world and and so i argue you know for sort of a, a sort of blue pill that doesn't necessarily have you succumb to whatever the official narrative is necessarily but doesn't have you reject it either that, that applies normal uh, human skepticism, normal standards of skepticism, a classic understanding. I mean, yeah, of course, we know that the New York Times can and does lie uh, in its reporting. We we learned that during the Gulf War or during the Iraq War. Right. right. Um, and uh, but uh, you know, and and we have to know that going in that uh, that that these media sources that we rely on can be wrong uh, and they can they are themselves uh, subject to manipulation by people within the government as well as outside it. Uh, and, but that's just the state of the world. That's the state of everything. And you just have to learn to, it, it really, takes critical thinking skills and, and an awareness and a normal healthy dose of skepticism, but also, uh, you know, let's at the bottom end of it, I think what America has been in is, or what it, we are actually in now is what I would call an epistemic crisis. Right. Um, which is that the, we can't even agree. Uh, epistem uh, sorry, epistemology, of course, is how we know the world and, and right. how people who are in the uh, uh, 
alternative universe of conspiracism know the world is through a very bizarre prism mm -hmm. that distorts all of their information and, and changes actually their relationship to the world. Um, and the, the result is that we wind up having, we have one narrative uh, that believes in this one version of reality that actually is bereft of factuality and a grounding in reality. Um, and another version that does try to, to deal with things in a sort of factual, logical and reasonable way. Um, and uh, we, the result is these two competing narratives have made it have you know the the what the alternative narrative has grown so large that as a nation we can't really even agree on what's a fact and what's not anymore right. and that to me is an epistemic crisis because democracy can't function without a, an agreed shared reality and yeah. we're not we're not agreeing on that shared reality anymore right and, and, yeah. and things like the New York Times are at least held ac accountable to, to widespread yes. public. And, and now in the time of Twitter, yeah. it's like there are really incredible Nobody. people who are. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Nobody. <laughs> and, you know, with these these fringe groups, it's there's no accountability. Everyone's delusion is everyone's misinformation is equal. Yeah. Whereas, you know, although the mainstream media has fallen to, you know, incorrect reporting and in the cases of Fox News, like intentional disinformation. Um, it's, you know, we have to get to some place where we can trust that after enough resources, right? Like there right. is there is a universe, there is a truth to be found. There, 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 there truth is out there. You, you just yeah. sometimes have to dig for it. Yeah. Um, so I, I got the idea to write red pill, blue pill, uh, mainly because, you know, after I had written Alt America, I could see that things were getting worse yeah. um, in terms of the uh, concerns that I was raising in that book. Mm -hmm. And I started thinking hard about, well, how what can I, uh, you know, it's it was a piece of journalism, primarily, and analysis that I was hoping it was helpful analysis, but I am primarily a journalist and so, you know, it was mostly a, a kind of a historical text. Um, and I realized it was time to actually write something that people could use. I mean, the, the information is useful and, and having the knowledge uh, is, is an incredibly important step because, you know, being forewarned is forearmed. And um, so I, I, you know, I felt like old America did that, but I wanted to write a book that give people tools for, for um, you know, uh, coping with what I could see was just this growing wave of conspiracism, um, partly because I was seeing that it was, you know, clearly one of the main engines of the growth of right-wing extremism. All of these right-wing extremist groups uh, uh, operate in this alternative universe. And, um, but it was, but it was also, you know, extremely concerned about, you know, the sort of personal effects, the effects it was having in our personal lives. I just know, I was having too many stories of people going so far off the deep end uh, of conspiracy theories that, you know, in one case, a, a young man who lived on an island uh, near me uh, uh, murdered his father because wow. he believed his father was. He had gotten so far into Pizza Gate that he thought his father was uh, participating in the pedophile ring because wow. his father was a mainstream Democrat, you know? Wow. And, and um, another guy, another guy uh, who actually had you know, illness issues who lived probably less than a mile from me uh, uh, killed his brother by running a sword through his head because he thought he had become a lizard person. Uh, and 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 then um, finally, uh, a person very close to me, a uh, member of my family, uh, was in the audience in Las Vegas uh, on October first at wow. the uh, mass shooting and barely survived. And 
the that shooter was another right wing conspiracy theorist. It yeah. was something that was actually suppressed by law enforcement in Las Vegas. And um so you know I had some actual personal motives uh yeah. to to write about it. Yeah and you can read her story in the book. It's uh, pretty dramatic. Wow. So, yeah. uh well, uh, I, I guess I want to end it on a slight positive note. Yeah, um, <laughs> I'm gonna get my back <laughs> I got my my uh, my it's fine dog. So obviously everything is fine. Um, I, I guess I just you know, I you there mentioned the voting. Part of the idea of the book was to get. I, I do spend the last couple three chapters explaining to people how how, how you go about pulling someone you know and love out of this rabbit hole, out right. of these rabbit yeah. holes. And it is possible, but it's not easy. Right. It's a lot of work. Mm -hmm. You have to decide if it's worth it. It needs to be someone that you care about mm -hmm. and who's worth it because it is, it's an incredible amount of effort to, to make it happen. But uh, I, I think we all know somebody that we love and care about who's gone down these rabbit holes. So. Yeah. Uh, even, even oh, yeah. I thought, well, at least this book will be handy, hopeful, hopefully to a lot of people. So Yeah. And it's also interesting to watch, like, I've seen inklings about it around, you know, I'm, I just turned 30, like, of the people my age, millennials of, even I, I hear some people talking a lot about like, like, pedophilic rings and they just like all of a sudden have an, an interest or a, a worry about this being like a real thing threat in their life. And I'm like, uh, like I, and I don't no. even know how to begin to combat that, right? Because right. it's just like, I, to some extent, you realize like, I know you're a reasonable person who probably hates Trump, but where are you getting this, right? And then that's where we right. see the QAnon like trickle, right? Where it's like, yeah. Well, I, the, I, the Epstein case too. I, I can tell you one of the first things that, we'll tell, that we tell you as a step is that uh, don't try to use logic, reason, and facts with them, because um, that's not what works for them. They will, and in fact, you'll lose your ability to to affect them if you do that, because then they see you as either one of the active conspirators yourself, or so, yourself, or a, a you know hapless sheeple who right. has just uh, succumbed to the deep state. Right. So. Um, the first step is to listen and yeah. be, be empathetic. And that's not an easy thing to do when they're spouting crazy shit. You know? Right, right, right. <laughs> you know? yeah. Believe me, huh? I, 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 I could not tell you the truth unless it was somebody I really cared about. Yeah. So I guess the steps are make sure to vote. Uh, I know that Marcos has been saying go vote early. That way, get out the yep. vote, people. Don't have to call you to remind you to vote. The second yes. you can vote, go vote. Um, if you really care if there's someone in your life that you want to talk to, go pick up your book so you can learn all the tips. But at the very start, like, just listen and try not to be, I guess right. we have to resist that urge to be like, you're crazy. You know, like we yeah, have to yeah, yeah. really be in yeah. a of empathy. The, the only thing that, that will pull them out is your relationship with them. Is mm -hmm. that your relationship with them becomes more important to them. Uh, it matters more to them than those conspiracy theories. And that takes a long, slow process. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, and there are numerous other steps that I describe in there, but uh, awesome. that's kind of the first step. Yeah, eventually lo facts, logic, and reason do play in, but it takes time, so. Yeah. People react emotionally first, and then it, the it, brain takes it. These are gut level narratives and people right. buy into them on that level. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, yeah, you know, they, they really believe, I mean, a lot of Hawaii Republicans and right wingers are acting the way they are now is that they've bought into this narrative that Democrats equal socialists and socialists are like communists. So they all just want to enslave us all. Right. I mean, that's, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's the narrative. They, they, never, they buy that, that stuff. And, yeah. and how do you combat that? Well, you, you're not really, you know, you can say, well, you don't know what socialism is, blah, 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 blah. You know, but, but it just doesn't work. You actually have to convince them that, no, really, I'm not that kind of person. I, I, I really do care about what you think, and I believe in your free speech as well. And, right. and, and I believe that, you know, in a, uh, 
open society where there's a multitude of different belief systems mm -hmm. and so on and so forth, rather than trying to go at them with, you, you basically have to go at them with the interpersonal narrative rather than the logical, factual narrative. So. Well, that's great. Uh, where can people pick up your book? Uh, you can buy it at any bookseller. I, I always urge people to go into their local bookstore if they got one, or, or you know, you can do it online usually at your local bookstore too, Perfect. and have have them order it because then they'll stack it on the shelves. Uh -huh. uh, but uh, but yeah, you can always get it at Amazon or Powell's or Barnes and Noble or any of the other online sellers as well. So awesome. it's, it's from Prometheus Books. Perfect. So. Thank yeah. you so much, David. This has been wonderful. <laughs> hey, likewise, and good to see you again, Kara. I hope of things course. are good in DC. Uh, I hope right. that they're they're good over there, and you get to see some whales soon. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I'm last weekend. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you have a good one, and thank All you right. everyone for joining us. Bye bye. All right, bye bye.